Hi there. One of the ongoing big issues in any economy is how best, how effectively, how fairly to fund healthcare for a country's population. That is certainly true in the UK. And in this short video, we're just going to look at some of the evaluation arguments for and against either an increase in healthcare funding funded by the state, uh, the idea of healthcare being a, a, an important merit good or merit service, if you like, versus the idea that there should be some alternative forms of funding, maybe the private sector should have more of a role, uh, or that there should be alternative different ways of funding healthcare other than the current system. Key thing, I think, uh, taking the long-term view is there's very strong pressure for increasing healthcare spending in many countries, including in the UK. Some of these uh, pressures, some of these factors are essentially demographic, some of them are economic, some of them are social, and some relate to fast-growing emerging health technologies. Here are six factors that are causing, for example, increased healthcare demand in the UK. We have an ageing population, uh, the median age of the population is rising, and that of course places great pressure on, on healthcare spending. It's often said that there's a kind of U-shape in terms of healthcare spend per person, high spending per head when you're coming into, your, coming into this world in the first few years of life, and often right at the end of life, increasing healthcare spending. For example, people with uh, chronic illnesses, and uh, end of year end of life care uh, for geriatric uh, patients, for example. Second key thing is that, that over time people's expectations of healthcare change, the people's expectations of what the state can and should provide, expectations of what their local hospital or medical services can offer, including GPs. So there's, in that sense, demand is driven by by growing expectations as particularly as a society gets gets richer. Third issue, I suppose, is the inequality issue that there's been a, a growing concern in recent times about inequality of income and wealth and whether that is leading, leading to uh, extra pressure on the healthcare budget. Uh, in particular, uh, the idea of uh, chronic illness and the illnesses associated with uh, inequality and deprivation, uh, asthma, for example, uh, poor health, stress-related illnesses. Our population is growing. A uh, slow rate of natural population growth, relatively speaking, but obviously strong net inward migration in recent times. Uh, population is growing, and that's an, an extra burden on, on the National Health Service. And, of course, new technology is creating new treatments all the time, many of which uh, are new drugs, new new, uh, new opportunities for, uh, for medicine. Many of those drugs and treatments are high cost, particularly in the early stages, until perhaps economies of scale have been fully exploited. And we have clearly big economic and social issues surrounding the rise of chronic illnesses associated, for example, with increased incidence of obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes and other related conditions. Put together, there is tremendous upward pressure on healthcare spending, healthcare spending in the UK. It's a big, big issue. Scarce resources under pressure. So that leads to the obvious question, who should fund and who should provide healthcare? Now that's quite an important distinction to make as an economist in year one micro. The funding of healthcare is not necessarily the same as the provision of healthcare. Should healthcare treatments be provided by the state through the NHS, as they are at the moment for most things, free at the point of need, or should markets play a bigger role in funding and providing healthcare? This is one of the great economic questions of any age, and it's certainly pertinent today. Well, how, how do you evaluate these, these, these ideas? Here's a few, a few thoughts on how to uh, generate improved evaluation. One is to talk about scale and scope. So you could ask the question, well, how important is healthcare to an economy? How significant is healthcare as a merit good? Uh, is it, you know, what are the economic consequences of better healthcare in terms of higher productivity, increased labour market participation, uh, better quality of life, for example? So if you think the multiplier effects of increased healthcare spending are strong, if you think there's a strong positive externality from better healthcare, then you might be tempted to argue for increased state funding of healthcare in terms of primary health and other, and other related services. Or might other areas of government spending become more important in the future, requiring a shift of resources? Are we 
Are we likely in the long term to have to shift our focus away from healthcare towards, who knows, early years education or towards defence or whatever, towards the environment? So a good evaluation approach is to ask the question, well, what should our priority be? Talk about significance. Second, a nice, strong evaluation uh, approach is to talk about short run and long run. So in the short run, for example, we can increase funding, perhaps in line with population growth or in line with GDP. We can protect healthcare funding in real terms. But in the long run, can a free national health service necessarily be sustained at current levels? Or will we have to remodel the service? I think it's really important in an essay on health, in the data response question on healthcare, to have a, a, a feel for an understanding of the concept of equity and fairness. So in access to healthcare, fair treatment, fair access, um, these are really, really important issues in the UK at the moment. And many people actually see free access to healthcare as a, as a fundamental human right. The NHS is part of the fabric, if you like, of our country. And uh, people regard access, equitable access to healthcare as a fundamental issue of, of fairness. Now, if you go down the market ref reform pathway, to what extent is that fairness issue under threat? And something we'll talk about in the next uh, few minutes is the idea of alternatives. What are the alternative ways of providing healthcare? Um, you know, at the moment, not most healthcare in this country is provided through collective taxation and provided free at the point of need. Are there different ways of funding it? Can we draw uh, from the experiences of other countries, for example? So let's build two cases in the next three or four minutes. They build, they build a case for saying the government should be spending more on healthcare. Um, taking the data from 2011 on the, on the right hand side here, the UK government uh, is a heavy spender on health. If you look at this range of countries, UK, Japan, Germany, China, India, we spend around 82% 80, of healthcare spending. Um, comes from the public sector, private sector is about 18%. Uh, whereas in other countries, it's significantly higher than that. In fact, in some countries, the private sector is bigger than the public sector. So what is the case for having a publicly funded, state-funded healthcare system? Well, here's the arguments. First of all, it helps provide equality of access. In other words, people should have a right to healthcare treatments, both emergency, accident and emergency treatments, and general healthcare uh, not based on somebody's income, not somebody, not based on somebody's ability to pay, but as of right. A state-funded service can provide imp impartial advice and help, helping to avoid some information failures. Some issues there to do with uh, moral hazard, where you might get sometimes get what's called supplier-induced healthcare spending. In the private sector, for example, you know, GPs or doctors. Private uh, consultants may suggest treatments that actually aren't really needed, but have a very strong commercial uh, value, a reward. So impart impartial advice and help is important. Um, but make, by making healthcare available cheap and, and readily available for the point of need, it can help to, to, to generate higher consumption and, and increase GDP. I think the main argument for healthcare funding by the state, of course, is the, is the merit good argument. The argument that affordable, widely accessible and high quality healthcare generates significant positive externalities. And you should be thinking of a diagram you could use there where the social benefit curve lies outside the private benefit curve. And there's the other argument that a big organisation such as the NHS, a large provider of healthcare, can enjoy significant internal economies of scale. For example, when they're buying drugs in from pharmaceutical companies or when they're negotiating contracts for, for food purchases, for example, in hospitals. NHS is a major employer, one of the biggest employers in the world, and in theory should be able to enjoy big economies of scale. And perhaps, perhaps, uncertainty here, it might be more efficient than the smaller private sector. Well, what's the counter argument? What, is, what are the arguments saying? Actually, no, let's give more... Uh, more emphasis, more weight to the private sector. Well, in the private sector, of course, it's uh, it's more excludable, it's more rival. Um, you don't necessarily have queues or rationing in some in, in private sector markets because uh, the private sector is able to respond to demand-led uh, healthcare treatments. So waiting lists are shorter in the private sector if you're willing and able to pay. Another argument for private market-based healthcare 
is that over time the best health firms, the best hospitals, or the best networks of hospitals will emerge and uh, best of breed businesses will be competing um, for the best staff, for the top um, treatments, the best facilities, and over time, uh, best healthcare providers may, may be more dynamically efficient. Indeed, they may well specialise in certain treatments, uh, whereas the NHS may, may be providing general, general care. Private sector providers driven by the profit motive may be more anxious to cut costs, to increase labour productivity, reduce waste, perhaps less prone to diseases of scale, perhaps. And there's also an argument for saying if people know that they're going to be paying for their health care, uh, this is a kind of moral hazard issue again, if people know that they will have to pay for certain health care treatments, it might be a nudge influencing some of their lifestyle choices about exercise and diet, smoking, etc. It might, if you know you have to pay. No guarantees here, but it's just, it's just another counter-argument. Okay, so there's some big arguments for funding healthcare. Before, actually, before I finish, so let's look at some alternatives, actually, for funding healthcare. Because um, I wanted to think about, you know, necessarily moving away from healthcare free at the point of need. Okay? The reason for putting this final slide in is because a good evaluation, strong evaluation, often thinks about the alternatives. Okay, so we know the NHS is under pressure, uh, big funding challenges. What about some of the alternatives? Well, here are one or two. So the idea is to give you some ideas for uh, just reducing the pressure on state health budgets. One option could be to give individuals and families an incentive to take out private health care insurance. Uh, some companies already do that. So, you know, would you be in favour of more generous tax relief if you take out private health care? The argument being there that people with private health care almost free up resources for the NHS in that sense. You could increase basic prescription charges so that you could lift the sort of prescription charge from a trip to the GP, uh, making necessary uh, adjustments for families who can't afford um, prescriptions, prescription charges, sorry. So you can lift the charge on that to bring in some extra income. Some people are suggesting that some NHS hospitals should provide a kind of excludability rival nature by introducing private hotel style rooms, bedrooms, to raise extra revenue for patients who want, for example, extra privacy during a long stay in hospital and are willing to pay. There's been one suggestion that there should be a kind of basic annual NHS subscription system, a little bit like the um, the BBC licence fee. I don't know, off the top of my head, if somebody paid £300 or something into the NHS, they would be able to receive up to £300 of treatment free. Uh, thereafter, they might be able to top up their subscription, but that will provide a basic floor. You could think uh, slightly more laterally here and suggest that you might want to encourage uh, health tourism in overseas countries. Uh, indeed, many developing emerging nations are developing specialisms in, in healthcare. Uh, there's ethical issues about that, but often they can provide uh, things like cataracts and, uh, and other forms of electric, su electric surgery at much lower prices. So you can make a case almost for saying that that will be a more efficient use of resources. And thinking long term, thinking really long term, I think you have to, you have to consider the amount of money allocated to preventative programmes. So the burden on the NHS would be lower, other things being the same if we were more successful in preventing some of the treatments, some of the conditions, that uh, the chronic illnesses and things that have become so topical in the newspapers at the moment, in particular diabetes and stress-related illnesses. Tackle the root cause rather than the symptoms of the problem. Okay, so this has been a discussion of some of the, the economics of funding healthcare. It's one of those classic economic debates, and it's something you know, I think you can get your economic jaws stuck into. Thank you.